So, welcome everyone to today's webinar um, organized by Eight Section Europe and um, the Access and Affordability Program uh, of Eight Section Europe. And you will hear a little more about this program uh, shortly from uh, Oksana Panochenko, who leads this project at Eight Section Europe. My name is Tomasz Beretsky, and I will host this webinar today. Um, the program for today will be um, two presentations. Uh, one will be held by myself, and I will speak about um, global intellectual property regimes and schemes after a short introduction from Oksana. And then it's uh, Dr. Sabine Fogler uh, from the WHO Collaborating Center for Pharmaceutical Pricing and Reimbursement Policies, sitting in Vienna, Austria. Uh, she leads this department, and she will talk about how, um, what possibilities are there to improve access to HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis medicines, and what is the role of pricing policies in improving access. All of this will then, of course, be followed by a questions and answers session. So you are very welcome to either type your questions and comments into the chat box or uh, raise your hand, and then we will give you the floor um, towards the end of the webinar. And we are, of course, here to answer your questions as well. So I would suggest that we uh, start with a short introduction from Oksana, uh, and I suppose she will also mention uh, again, but I would like to repeat that this webinar is recorded and will then be available for you um, on the AIDS Action uh, Europe website and also on the health um, uh, portal of um, uh, the Commission. So, Oksana, I think it's your turn. Take it away. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I know it is Friday afternoon in June, um, so I really, really appreciate your interest in our webinar. Um, I would also like to take this moment and to say thank you to our perfect, brilliant speakers, Tamas Beretsky and Dr. Sabina Fogler. So my name is Oksana Panochenko. I work at Eight Action Europe. Um, we are the network of around 420 HIV service organizations working in the WHO European region. Um, before we start, I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk about our contribution at Eight Action Europe to the topic of affordability and medication. Um, so, Steering Committee of Eight Action Europe identify affordability of healthcare with special focus on prices and medications uh, as one of the priority fields of our work. This resulted in 2015 in development of training manual for organizations and activists. Uh, thank you very much, Tamas, for working on this. Uh, this manual is available on Clearinghouse at Eight Action Europe website if you want to find it. It's in open access. So based on this manual, we conducted six regional trainings for activists and people working in the field, five in English and one in Russian. So in 2016, we had three regional trainings, one in the Baltic states, which took place in Riga, uh, one for uh, Central and Southeast Europe, which was in Belgrade, and another one was in Athens for the uh, Central and Southeast Europe EU countries. In 2017, we had another three trainings. Two of them were in English, and one of them was in Russian language uh, in uh, uh, Kiev for the EECA region. Um, uh, so with the experience of these regional trainings, it became very clear that the language is the main barrier to knowledge access. So with this in mind, our steering committee decided to move more to national trainings and national languages. Uh, this was reflected in our new strategic plan for 2018-2021, which is also available on our clearinghouse. And you can find there what exactly we are doing and what we are planning to do. So in 2018, the training manual, the previously uh, developed training manual, was updated and it received a new chapter with training guidance. It is also openly available on the, our clearinghouse. Um, in, last year, we conducted two training for trainers altogether. Uh, 12 people from uh, 10 countries participated in the TOTs. Uh, this was the first step on our way to conduct national trainings in the national languages in 2020. Um, so for this year, uh, we had two webinars planned, this time, uh, this time and another one on exchange of initiatives and good practices in the field of affordability and access to medication and diagnostics. 
and the second webinar is planned for the autumn this year. Uh, and for the next two years, we want to, we are planning to focus more on conducting national trainings in the countries. Uh, so this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Please enjoy my beautiful cat. And on this note, I would like to give the floor to Tamash. Thank you very much, Oksana. This is really an exciting project. And um, uh, actually, it's been a privilege to um, to go through this project with you and um, and mentor um, this project together with you. Um, it's really been quite exciting. Now, my topic for today um, will be, um, and let me share my slides with you uh, for this. So my topic for today will be intellectual property regimes and uh, what challenges they pose to civil society. Here you can see my affiliations, that's not so exciting. Uh, also my disclosures, and when you uh, get, your, uh, get these slides, uh, my slides later, then you will be able to click on the references as well um, if you would like to follow up on the topics that I talk about today. Uh, my presentation will be about 30 minutes, and then um, Sabina will take over from me. So our key topics for today, it's a very simple concept, something that we've been repeating throughout um, uh, the, the course of um, this series of training uh, sessions, um, that medicines are very expensive, and so oftentimes patients who need these medicines don't have access to them. Uh, we try to understand what is the impact of the current uh, intellectual, global intellectual property regimes on access and affordability. And the other thing that we try to understand and try to work around a little bit is how we in civil society can work together for better access and affordability um, of not just medicines, uh, but health technologies in general, which includes di diagnostics and procedures as well and how we can do that on long term. Now, there are some basic tenets that, um, that underlie our work. The first one is that the right to health is a fundamental human right. So um, this, is, this is actually something that defines our work throughout uh, the, 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 or through these years. Um, and another key aspect is for us that we want to focus on evidence. So we do evidence-based advocacy and we want to focus, we want to build upon our strengths. This is also why we um, do our utmost to invite knowledgeable professionals uh, to talk to us about issues that matter, such as Sabine will today. Uh, also, we need to think out of the box and we need to think creatively. This is what civil society does, but we must remain realistic. There are certain things that we can achieve and some other things that we will not be able to achieve. Uh, we have to strike the right balance in this. So, Basically, it is access to medicines and diagnostics, and we try to understand how one can navigate this maze um, uh, through, uh, through civil society work and through better understanding of, this, of the underlying systems and mechanisms. You've already heard from Oksana um, about uh, the project, so I will not talk about that in detail. But let's first see what is intellectual property at all. We describe as intellectual property patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Um, I will give you a short explanation of each of these categories and what they mean as uh, I uh, progress. But these are the four major categories of intellectual property that we um, deal with uh, today uh, globally. Now, patents are an intellectual property right, so it is, it is an, an, an ownership granted by a government uh, of a nation, or it can also be an international organization, granted to an inventor that gives him or her an exclusive right. So this is important. It's an exclusive right to the invention for up to 20 years, and we will talk a little bit about the certain exceptions or um, uh, extensions of this rule. And this right is granted in exchange for disclosing the details of this new technology to the society so that the society can ultimately benefit from it. 
Copyrights, which is a different category of intellectual property rights, is a, is a property right that is granted again by a government or an international organization, a multinational organization, to the author of, original, of an original literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, or other eligible creative work. So copyrights are not for inventions, but they are for cultural, for creative works. Trademarks, however, which is the third form of intellectual property right, is again granted by a government or by an international institution to an individual or a business or a legal entity, and it creates then um, and uses a distinctive word or a name or a symbol, uh, or it can also be a device by which it can distinguish its products or services from others who provide similar products or services. The easiest way to understand trademarks is indeed when you think about company logos that are so widespread all around the world. And then there are trade secrets, which is the fourth category of um, intellectual uh, property rights. Um, and that's uh, publicly not available, uh, protected um, uh, intellectual property. So this, these are secrets which belong to a given company or to a given institution. Now, the history of patents goes back a long time. Actually, um, this type of protection was already there even in Greece 500 years um, uh, before our time. And then there was a resurgence of, uh, or a reinvention, if you like, of um, written uh, protection of, um, uh, of inventions uh, in Europe from the um, uh, 700s, now 1700s, sorry. Um, however, we also understand that early patent systems primarily enforced uh, the, the wealth of the elites. It was a very expensive and cumbersome process to have your inventions protected. And that process was then significantly simplified in the 20th century especially in the United States and then the intellectual the, the current scheme or the current system of intellectual property protection and intellectual property rights was built up and was then expanded many will argue that uh, the current um, patent systems also protect the wealth of the elites there is an ongoing discussion about this, how free, how easily accessible this system is. There's one thing that's quite certain, that the protection or the system of protection of, uh, of intellectual property rights is a very complicated, a very difficult to navigate um, uh, system, which poses a lot of challenges and questions. Um, and also because of its complexity and because of its um, uh, difficult accessibility, it, is, it, it can indeed be an impediment for smaller businesses or for individuals if they would like to get their intellectual property protected or get involved in this system in the first place. Now, there are two various th theories or two main theories um, uh, that uh, underlie um, the protection of intellectual property. One is the bargain theory, which says that society and the, in the, in the individual, the inventor, or it, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be an individual, it can also be a, an organization, a company, um, uh, strike a deal, make a bargain. Um, so between the society and the inventor, there's a bargain, and this bargain uh, is then balanced in order to make sure that um, uh, society benefits from the inventions, but also the individual or the organization which makes the invention uh, sees the benefit. Now, the other approach is the natural rights theory, which says that uh, the protection of somebody's invention, somebody's intellectual product, um, is a natural right, and therefore it's due to him to, um, to uh, so that he or she or the organization deserves this type of protection because it belongs to them by nature. Um, uh, and so therefore, society has to compensate the, uh, to the person or the organization for making this invention or having this effort um, made. Oops, 
that was too much. Now, if we talk about um, drug development or medicine development, we understand today that this is a very lengthy and a risky and difficult process. And I will not go into much detail. This is also something that we've discussed thoroughly during the course. And you can look up on the internet. There are several materials about that. Also, uh, you find those materials in the European Patients Academy's website. Um, now, patient organizations deal with drug development and focus on drug development uh, for these reasons that are listed in this slide. First of all, we have to understand what the pipeline of treatments is, how that looks like, what is coming up. Also, we have to understand how trials are designed, how patients um, are dealt with, whether it's uh, the patient or the market that's primarily concerned uh, when medicine development is done. We also need to understand how industry makes decisions about drug development uh, on the short, medium, and long term. Um, the availability of clinical trials is essential for us because oftentimes clinical trials are also a means of access to medicine um, uh, or even diagnostics. Uh, we have to um, uh, understand how barriers come about and how we can overcome these barriers. So not just the science, but also the policy part of medicine development is important for patient organizations and for civil society. And ultimately, what we need to also understand is how medicines reach or do not reach the patients, because that's our ultimate concern uh, during, this, uh, during this work. Now, you will see that patents and intellectual property are parts of this process throughout. So if you look at the spectrum of um, um, medicine development, medicine research and development, um, and look at these various stages and tasks that arise in this process, you will see that, um, uh, that patients first of all, do have and play a role throughout this whole process, but also at every single point, there can be and there are intellectual properties emerging that need to be protected or where the inventors or the owners want to obtain protection for these intellectual property rights or these properties. First of all, when you set research priorities, of course, this is something when you put a lot of thought uh, into um, what you want to do in the future. And if you have a good idea, you might think that it's, it's worth the while to protect that idea. Um, also, how you fundraise, you, might have, you may have a, a methodology for that. And that methodology is, again, something that can be protected under, under intellectual property uh, rights, and so on and so forth. So it's not restricted only to the final product. It's not restricted only to, um, to a particular drug or a molecule that comes out of this process in the end as a medicine, or it's not restricted to the name of that given medicine, which would be a trademark in this case. But throughout this whole process, there are numerous points where intellectual property protection can come into the picture. So it becomes even more complex, even more complicated, even if we speak about only one product, it can be a whole cloud, if you like, of various intellectual property rights that, uh, that need and uh, even deserve uh, protection, as, uh, as some people will argue. Now, let's look at the basics. Um, as we already discussed, intellectual property refers to the creations of the mind. So you use your brain and your creativity and you, uh, and you bring about a product. So these are inventions or artistic works and these are discoveries. This can be symbols and as we've already discussed, this can be names and images or designs. This I've already uh, also mentioned, um, uh, which are used in commerce, so which are used in commercially. And then there is a, a set of exclusive rights that are recognized um, in intellectual property property law for the protection of these, um, of these, uh, these property forms. Now, 
it is a protection over something that is a competitive advantage in the marketplace, right? So I have this intellectual property protected because I believe that this makes me or this makes my product better than that of others. So I want to prevent them from replicating my business, from replicating my work. And there, this is the reason why I obtain protection, legal protection um, uh, for them. Well, most of technological development that you see around the world is the result of cooperative ventures, people and organizations working together. Um, and they are also cross-cutting, so they are not limited to just one sector, but they can come from the private sector, from universities and government entities, public entities, or com various combinations of these. And um, if the intellectual property uh, protection is described well, then this also may, gives them the possibility to share the risks and the costs and the benefits of the innovations. So joint research um, requires this kind of protection. Um, uh, also, uh, technological breakthroughs require this protection, uh, which is currently provided through patents. Another important point that we need to remember here is um, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, which is abbreviated as TRIPS, which then requires more attention than other intellectual property rights. And I will explain to you why they deserve more attention. So TRIPS and TRIPS flexibilities are um, integral and legally binding parts of the, of the uh, World Trade Organization. And here you can see the logo of the World Trade Organization. Um, these are comprehensive rules and standards to protect um, uh, the uh, intellectual property. Um, and this includes copyrights, trademarks, patents, and this came into force actually already in 1995, on January the 1st, 1995. Um, it requires member countries, member states, to grant patents for inventions, um, um, regardless if it is um, in, in any field of technology. But there are certain requirements in order to obtain this kind of protection. They must be new, they must, so there must be a novelty aspect. They must involve um, uh, an inventory step, which means that it has to be a new one, an invention, so there must be an invention behind it. And also, they must be capable of industrial application. So you have to be able to translate. You have to be able to translate the invention into an industrial application. Now. This um, the the trips um, narrow uh, the gaps um, uh, how these rights can be or are protected around the world, um, and also they include all of them under a common set of international rules. So that's the real importance of them. Also, um, they establish a, a minimum level of pr uh, protection, um, uh, which uh, each government has to give to the intellectual property. Uh, stemming from other WTO members, WTO is the World Trade Organization, um, so that the, a balance can be st uh, struck between the long-term benefits and the possible short-term costs to society, right? So uh, there, there should be, a, ultimately, there should be a balance between uh, how much society pays uh, or invests into um, uh, an invention or into an intellectual property and how much long-term benefit comes out of that. So. This means that actually um, intellectual property protection should encourage the creation and invention process. Um, and especially when this period of protection already expires and creations and inventions enter the public domain. So that's also that period should also be thought of. Right? So what happens after the 20 um, uh, years, uh, that's the usual period of intellectual property protection. Now, However, governments do have flexibilities, do have rights to reduce um, um, the, the, the protection or to modify these, these protectionary means like patents or trademarks through various exceptions. For example, if they want to tackle public health problems, and then we will also come to speak about um, uh, compulsory licensing and voluntary licensing. These are measures where, um, where governments that governments can use in order to reduce 
the period uh, or the validity of this um, uh, of, the, of the intellectual right protection for example if they want to tackle public health problems and we've seen examples for this uh, over the last couple of years for example also in the field of hepatitis c so the trips agreements uh, agreement sorry allows governments to use compulsory licensing for pharmaceuticals, for medicines, but also for other patents. But these areas, in these cases, when it is possible, are very well defined and well described. So patents are a legally provided and secured monopoly for the manufacturing of a certain product. This is a pretty straightforward uh, definition. They are granted by the state or an intergovernmental organization which has the right to do so. Patents are usually valid for 20 uh, years, but there can be special cases and extensions. Um, and they are right now seen as a necessary tool to protect the market and to ensure a steady revenue stream for the companies or for the inventors so that they can do more research. Of course, there's a lot of debate about how much is needed to continue research and uh, how much of the revenue stream actually flows into research. All of these are areas where civil society can rightfully make an inquiry and look into the processes, dig a little deeper and try to understand what's going on in the structures um, uh, on, on the level of the organizations or even individuals who do research and try to understand um, um, how, what the proportions are, how much is spent for what. However, it has also become an extremely complex legal field and business by, by today. So the protection, the registration, the management of patents um, and intellectual property rights has become um, an, 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 a business sector in itself. Um, often, they are also seen as a barrier to access to common goods. Um, and then there's also an ongoing debate about um, to what extent pharmaceuticals are or can be or should be common goods um, and um, to I mean to what depth this protection um, should be there or to to what extent access to common goods should be provided and there are also and we, we know this uh, pretty well several models of how intellectual property rights can be challenged now, as I mentioned already, patents, there, there's been an explosion in the registration and, um, and use uh, of patents uh, over the recent um, uh, decades. First of all, because most of the processes and many products in biotechnology, uh, including medicines, are patentable. So it makes sense to use um, uh, this tool to protect uh, your, your intellectual product. Um, also, patents are available um, and you can enjoy your patent rights regardless of where your invention was made, which field of technology you are in, and uh, whether these products are imported or produced locally. So it's a, it's a very broad uh, protection that you get uh, if your patent is, uh, is registered and, and acknowledged. Um, also, um, if you when when you consolidate um, uh, private research, so research that's done in in private companies or by uh, private individuals, that already means that the intellectual property uh, right is extended on every product stemming from that. So. Actually, uh, even though it took f first in the United States 200 years to approve 6 million patents, there's been ex an explosion after that um, uh, in, in, the, in the last uh, few decades, and especially towards the, I mean, from the second half of uh, the 20th century, uh, in the registration of new, of new um, uh, patents. Um, and by the time when these uh, 6 million patents uh, were um, uh, approved, and registered in the United States uh, by the middle of the 50s, there were already another 3 million new applications flowing in. So you see that it's, it's really um, uh, growing uh, explosively, uh, uh, this, this field um, of, um, of rights. Let's also consider the free trade agreements. The free trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, or the, the, um, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership, uh, these are 
uh, trade agreements that allow the free flow of goods. Trade agreements are signed by countries uh, and they allow the free flow of goods um, uh, at reduced or no tariffs. So customs tariffs are reduced or uh, eliminated and, and procedures are simplified. These are also confidential conditions. So um, uh, the general public is not aware of how trade actually happens uh, through um, or across these countries. Um, we also understand that uh, these um, free trade agreements uh, give a priority to the interests of multinational pharmaceutical and also other businesses and medical uh, uh, companies over patients because um, their, I mean, their interests and their rights uh, are enshrined in free trade agreements, while the rights uh, of patents are currently not enshrined in such uh, uh, agreements or treaties. Also, um, the free trade agreements usually impose limitations on generic medicines. This is one of the reasons why it's uh, still relatively difficult to access generic medicines in, uh, for example, in uh, Europe. And also free trade agreements allow uh, companies and uh, countries to overrule the, uh, the rules of the TRIPS agreement. So this may lead to conflicts, in, especially with regard to um, access to medicines. Now, some uh, additional points of interest um, when we come to talk about patents uh, are the supplementary protection certificates. Supplementary protection certificates extend the period of patent protection by the amount of time that was needed to register the product. This is what we see in case of Truvada happening right now um, in various countries of the world um, where uh, the patent protection of this particular product is expiring, expired last year, is expiring this year or next year, according to the supplementary protection certificates that uh, the manufacturing company holds with regard to this compound or this uh, uh, product in the given country. So this is the reason why um, uh, the patent production of this particular product does not expire at the same time everywhere, because they were not, it was not registered at the same time everywhere. We are also aware of, uh, of, the, of the mechanisms of evergreening when a product uh, which already enjoys a, a, a patent production undergoes a minor change uh, which is usually not significant um, and carries no uh, clinical benefit. And um, this, however, this minor change uh, leads to a new patent registered, and this new patent enjoys another 20 years uh, of protection. So once again, this market is, or the, the, the market of the given product is immediately uh, uh, locked um, away from uh, competitors. We should also understand the mechanisms of voluntary licensing. The voluntary licensing process is when the patent holder, so the patent beneficiary, grants manufacturing licenses, manufacturing rights to another party. So they waive their interest in uh, protecting their own manufacturing rights. They give it out to other uh, parties, usually against a royalty. So they still get paid, but it's not they, it's not them who manufacture the product or sell the product, but a different party. We see numerous examples for this, um, uh, both in Europe and also outside of Europe. Also compulsory and mandatory licensing, which I've mentioned before, is when a government or an international organization uh, assumes or requisites the license or the patent um, for an acknowledged reason under trips. Uh, this happened, for example, with uh, direct uh, acting agents against um, hepatitis C in, uh, in India. This can happen in case of an epidemiological emergency or if there's no novelty. We've, we've heard this argument as well um, uh, for certain pharmaceuticals. It's not new, so this innovative aspect is not there. Or if there's an economic crisis, so again, which may lead to, um, uh, to a health emergency. So in these cases, um, governments have the right to uh, assume the licenses, give it out to other manufacturers, and require manufacturing of the given product. Now, of course, activists 
can use patent opposition and should also do patent opposition if possible. There are certain uh, initiatives for that already, and there's even a website uh, which is called www.patentopposition.org, um, which lists all the various patent opposition initiatives. Um, it's a very interesting collection of what is out there, and I recommend that you look at this for yourselves, um, and that you also consider cooperating and expanding um, uh, your work and your knowledge in this area, because I think by now you also understand, and Sabine's presentation will only add to this uh, knowledge, um, so you probably understand that this is an extremely complex field. No one can succeed in this alone. So this really is something that civil society can and should do um, uh, together. So how are then medicine prices determined? There are various models. Uh, it's usually a secret. So the ultimate um, uh, system is, uh, is, uh, is kept secret. It's a trade secret. It's also ultimately usually a business direction. And we know very little, but we will learn a lot more today from uh, Sabina about this particular um, uh, field. Why are we dealing with this in the first place? Why is this so important? Um, and the reason why we are doing or, or why we are talking about this is because we find that oftentimes um, uh, patients are denied access to new to novel treatments and oftentimes we hear that the reason why they are denied access is the price also there's a lot of confusion around the cost the price and the value of the medicine. So this is again a very interesting conversation that's going on in patient um, communities that I suggest that you follow up on um, and try to understand what the differences are between um, between cost, price, and value. Now, also there's evidence uh, by uh, now uh, from Eric Lowe, um, who uh, has developed this slide, uh, but also from uh, Professor Andrew Hill or from uh, Professor Alan Toon, um, that drug pricing is not or not always in line with societal views or values um, uh, or what health systems are willing to pay. Um, and Often you will see that health systems are uh, seen uh, or see themselves as a zero-sum game and they are obsessed with price cutting, which often then leads to poor decision making, which should be avoided as much as possible. And this is where civil society can and should play a role. So this is a very difficult, a very complicated landscape. It's pricing is, an in, is a national process, but then there are international influences. And I know that Sabina will talk about this in more detail. Um, high prices affect patients. Pricing is linked to reimbursement, but the two things are not the same. So um, we need change in the pricing system to, if we want to ensure that national access is sustainable. And also we understand that, that patients and patient groups can and should play a role in finding solutions um, and, and being an honest broker between the parties so that they can talk to each other better. So this is not about confrontation. This is not about challenging uh, the various parties. It's more bringing them together around the table and trying to understand how we can reconcile interest. Uh, or interests across this process. This is, I think, um, the most important role of patient organizations and of civil society organizations, uh, which, by the way, is happening to an increasing extent. Now, that was more or less my presentation. And I'm really looking forward to what Sabina has to um, uh, add to this um, uh, because I've already seen some of her slides and they really look exciting. And then I'm looking forward also to receiving your questions. So um, with this, it's over to Sabine. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Sabine Vogler. And I, I'm pleased that I was invited to give you a presentation about access to medicines. I was asked to focus on medicines for HIV, Hep C or TB, but as you will see, it's on medicines in general because there are certain rules that are of relevance. Uh, just uh, to present myself, uh, 
Uh, my name is Sabine Vogler and I work at the Austrian Public Health Institute where I had the former economics department and our institute is owned by the Ministry of Health in Austria and we do support for the Austrian Ministry of Health but we do also a lot of research for for instance European Commission or WHO and uh, to explain my role also as being director of a WHO collaborating center means that our department was nominated as a center that collaborates with WHO as we are doing probably quite useful work for them and uh, but it does not mean that I am WHO or I would have the mandate to speak as WHO or being WHO staff. I have no conflict of interest to declare and I would like to take the opportunity to thank some people uh, that kind of helped me that I can do presentations, research and things like that. That's on the one hand my team, but also a lot of the information that you will see stems from the work that we have been doing together with competent authorities for pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement in several countries. Uh, we had a network of competent authorities, the PPI network in, 20, in 49, in 47 uh, countries and uh, with them we help them to share information and at the same time uh, we gain also a lot of information. So what I'm going to talk about, um, the outline is as follows. I would like to start to give you and present to you some concepts, some definitory and terminology work about all these terms that are always used about access, affordability, availability, just to set the scene. And then I'd talk about different reimbursement policies and also pricing policies. I mean, that's a very large area and I hope that I will be able to present uh, uh, some snapshots like let's say on it within the 20 minutes that was given to me and also make clear why it's important to have appropriate price regulation, pricing policies that can help to improve access to medicines. And before I start with the definitions, uh, I would just like to share with you some uh, results of a study that we did together with colleagues from WHO that was on sofosporia and I just have to say uh, these are the results uh, as of uh, 2015 so at the time before the alternatives were available so it's on, on sofosporia sovaldi and what did we do we did on the one hand a price survey uh, where we collected price data from several countries and we compared them and we even assumed a discount which we found in literature, a discount of 23%. But uh, what you can see in, in this slide is when you then um, weigh the data by purchasing power parities, you see that certain countries more the lower income countries like Poland and Turkey were those who paid purchasing power parities adjusted prices that were higher. And when it then comes to affordability of the medicines, we took the price data and put them into relation to total pharmaceutical expenditure and we just took sofosporia. We left out all the other issues, all the other costs but just taking sofosporia, purchasing power parities adjusted, we saw that it takes a country at least one-tenth of total pharmaceutical expenditure, and that was the Netherlands. But there were countries like Poland, while where they, the price for the sofosporia would be nearly twice of what they pay in total for pharmaceuticals. So this is, I would say, a clear indication of non-affordability of medicines. And 
Uh, Tamash already uh, alluded to that, but when you talk about medicines and the price of medicine of being a barrier, we have to keep in mind the question, who pays for medicines? Well, there can be two parties. On the one hand, it can be the state, the public payer, NHS system, social insurance system, however it is organized, so the public payer. In several cases, it's the public payer paying only a part and then certain co-payments are possible. Or it's the patient paying, co-paying, or even in many cases, paying fully out of pocket. In many low and middle income countries, people pay even formal high out of pocket payments, or they would have to pay, I'd better say. And this means uh, many people can't do that. Uh, and this uh, would lead to catastrophic payments. So I just talked about one element of non-accessibility of medicines. That is that the medicines are not affordable. But there are other elements why access to medicine is not there for many people worldwide for the medicines of the therapeutic groups uh, I was asked to talk about, but for medicines in general. It might be that uh, the medicines are not produced in good uh, quality, that they do not need meet high regulatory standards. So um, worst cases like counterfeit medicines, bad quality medicines. So a need is there that the regulatory authorities make sure that quality of the medicines is ensured. If this is not the case, medicines are not available. Medicines might not be available even if they have a registration, a marketing authorization, but they are companies decide not to market them because the market is too small, it's a poor country, it's not attractive, there's not a public payer that has the money to pay for it, or for certain strategic reasons, for instance, due to certain pricing policies, uh, companies say, okay, I will market it at a later time. Or it might be that the medicines are not available for a certain time, so the shortages, you've probably heard all about it. So this is all the area of availability, which also um, leads to the fact that medicines are not accessible. So, Tamash also presented some timeline or some, some, some overview of the value chain. I also want to do this uh, in a little bit uh, different picture. When we think about a medicine, it has a very long uh, life or a long development phase. So, before it comes to the market, before the launch, it is being developed, there is R&D, there is clinical research, then it must be registered, it must be marketing authorization. So this is all where the state can work with so-called pre-launch measures. When it then comes to the market and is ensured uh, that it may be marketed, then there's the question, will it be funded? Will it be taken up into the benefits package scheme of a country? Can it be funded? Uh, how much? What's the percentage? And which will be the price? So this is around the launch. And then governments should also think about after launch, is there any need for doing any follow-up action, for doing um, monitoring for ensuring that, for instance, cost-effective and lower-priced medicines are prescribed, are used, so this is the post-launch area. In my presentation, I will focus only on pricing and reimbursement. And there's one point that I would like to make, uh, that it's important not to mix up 
the part of marketing authorization, or some people say registration, and pricing and reimbursement. Marketing authorization, that's the, the, the evaluation if a medicine is safe, is of good quality, and is effective. But a medicine has just to prove it against placebo. But then, if this is the case, then a marketing authorization will be granted. And in the European Union, we have, for instance, a harmonized process of marketing authorization for many products, so the EMA. And the other thing is then the question, will the medicine be funded by the state or co-funded, so reimbursement, and at which price? This is pricing and reimbursement, but these are two distinct processes, and pricing and reimbursement is a national competence. So it's the countries that decide individually on that. If we look at affordability, you are probably aware about data on pharmaceutical expenditure. I just wanted to present them once again, and you see quite a discrepancy across countries, in that case of the WHO European region. So even if this data are adjusted by PPP, by purchasing power parity, you see that, for instance, uh, in Switzerland it's high, and in Germany, and going down the line at the other end, you have the Russian Federation. This is one thing, how much is in total invested for pharmaceuticals. But I think what is even more interesting is then the question, what's the share of public funding as part of whole of total pharmaceutical expenditure? And here again, you see major uh, differences with rather the high-income countries at the very end, Germany, Luxembourg, Ireland, having paying more than 80 or 70 percent of pharmaceutical expenditure out of the public funds, while in other countries it goes down to 50 or 40 percent, and then we go down to the Russian Federation with 15 percent. And I think this is something we have to keep in mind. Does the state have the money, or would it be possible to increase the public share of funding so to ensure access to medicine and to improve affordability? If so, what are the instruments now to ensure that patients have access to uh, medicines and how to ensure affordability. It's through benefits package schemes. You could also call them for pharmaceuticals reimbursement lists or formularies. The idea behind that is that the public payer, the government, says for certain selected medicines, they are included into reimbursement, included in public funding. It's possible that there are still some co-payments, but in principle, uh, the public payer says they will be funded. And then they are put on so-called reimbursement lists. Reimbursement lists exist for the outpatient sector. They exist also formularies for the inpatient sector. And, and as I was asked to talk particularly also about HIV, uh, TB, and Hep C medicines, there are certain vertical programs in some countries of the WHO European region, particularly in Central Asia and, and Eastern Europe. What does this mean? A vertical program is a so-called program for certain diseases and if, uh, for instance, uh, for HOE or for TB, you will see it afterwards, and then the medicines are included uh, in this program, and then they are provided free of charge to patients, or I should rather say to eligible patients. That could also then be an issue. Yeah, and uh, in, in the Western European countries, 
there are less these vertical programs they rather work with reimbursement uh, lists that can either be positive lists so meaning certain medicines that are considered as eligible for reimbursement positive list or saying certain medicines will be excluded from reimbursement then it's a negative list which are the criteria to decide shall this medicine be funded yes or no the major criterion is the therapeutic benefit of a medicine and i have to say in most cases it's the added therapeutic benefit the added benefit or the added value in comparison to a therapeutic alternative which may or may not be another medicine and this added benefit is important because if you remember before i talked about marketing authorization for marketing authorization it's sufficient if the medicine is effective that's it but here it's really uh, the evaluation against the comparator that is important. There are other criteria which are also considered by the reimbursement agencies when they decide whether or not the medicine should be included in the reimbursement list, such as is the medical need, is the medical, are there certain medical priorities, the issue of very similar to cost effectiveness and more and more countries clearly say the budget impact is of importance this is something which we have seen in recent years that even high income countries say okay the medicine is cost effective but the budget impact is so enormous that uh, we really have to reconsider and i would just like to present the term of the essential medicines to you maybe you've already heard about it that's a term created by the world health organization which says that an essential medicine is a medicine that satisfies the priority healthcare needs of a population and they will be selected due to public health relevance evidence on efficacy and safety and comparative cost effectiveness and um, they are intended to be available so here again we have the availability within a functioning healthcare system so the healthcare system must be there must be sustainable at all times in the right doses in the right form in quality and safe and this is important at the price the individual and the community can afford so if you remember what I've showed you before that uh, who pays for the medicine it can be either the patient or the community the public payer and in many Western European countries often this term essential medicine is not used it's sometimes seen it as a concept for rather poor countries but in fact what this selection process for reimbursement is in fact also kind of selecting essential medicines but of course in richer countries the reimbursement lists usually have more medicines included than just uh, those of WHO essential medicines core list so you just see here an overview most countries decided to have positive lists negative lists are less common in the outpatient sector but you have to consider two things one thing is co-payments are still possible for the outpatient sector for the inpatient sector where the hospital formula is it's not and the other important thing is you see all the countries in Central Asia have a positive list but it's the question how many medicines were included in this list in the benefits package scheme so this needs to be considered and just to compare WHO has this list core list of essential medicines which is about 400 medicines you see here how many medicines in general there's a little bit outdated data are included in Western European countries 
and and I acknowledge that unfortunately we do not have the same base for counting here it's just at the level of active ingredients so you could increase the left numbers but still you see much less active ingredients included so as said the scope is really of importance I'm now going to present uh, three slides uh, why I have to say these are from a report that WHO Euro is currently doing on Central and Eastern European countries. It's not yet published, so uh, I just uh, share them with you now. And it's the question of are there certain dedicated programs for certain medicines? So these vertical programs I told you before and uh, for HIV, they are, and they should provide free access to HIV medicines. When we look, however, to uh, Hep C medications, you see that in many of these countries, this is not the case, and it's also an issue that uh, the free access to Hep medicines is not guaranteed. When we now turn to TB medicines, again, at least from the policy framework, it's there. There are certain vertical programs, and uh, they should ensure it. But you will now remember what I've said before. Uh, these are certain elements, and these are the policy elements, and probably some of you are from these countries and can tell me, okay, we have this policy element, but in practice, access is not insured, for instance, because medicines are not available. So my important message is these are important policy elements that help to improve access, but of course it's not all. And one major barrier, as it has been said several times, is of course the price of medicines that uh, lead to the fact that medicines are not uh, accessible, available. And when we talk about prices, I just want to make the concept. There are two ways. Either you have price control, or pr some people say price regulation, meaning that the state, the payer, the government, decides on the price. And how do they do it? through certain pricing policies. Or the other way is it's so-called free pricing. And then the company can decide uh, at the price it wants. I just also would like to remind that when a government decides on the price, they should not just only think about the expectory prices, but we have the experience that in unregulated settings, uh, if the margin for the wholesaler, for the pharmacist, for many intermediaries is not regulated, then the prices get high as well. So even if maybe prices are regulated at the factory price level and then a lot of add-ons come there, it also poses a, pro a lot of problems. And once again, I said that before, remember, pricing is a national competence. It's not done uh, jointly. I think we already talked about the issue that why should uh, medicines prices be regulated? I can tell you, I know it's always difficult with this kind of research, which we do to compare uh, different situations but we have seen from countries that introduce price regulation that price regulation helps to uh, lower the prices, and this makes price medicines more affordable. The question is, which medicines should have price regulation? All or just those which uh, are paid by the state? And there are different approaches. You see in European countries, many uh, countries say, at least for those that are publicly funded, we regulate the prices. But some others say, no, we regulate it for all of them. 
but she's also rational because if the other medicines are to be paid by the patient, uh, then of course they should also be accessible. So there are different ways how to do it. And uh, how I would like to spend the last minutes on the issue of how to regulate prices. And I could talk about that the whole afternoon, but uh, there, there, there are certain points that I would like to make. First of all, one has to cleverly think about which price poly, pricing policy is the best for the kind of medicine I want to regulate. There are certain policies that are more useful for new medicines and others are typically generic pricing policies. So you have to think that through. And another thing that I would also like to mention is what we see is that certain pricing policies are on a supplementary basis. So uh, that you start with one policy, I can explain that a little bit later, for instance with external price referencing, but it doesn't bring you the price that you can pay and then a certain other policy is used. Another point that I would like to make is all pricing policies have their benefits and have their limitations. It's important, and that's what we see also from evidence, it's important to choose a pricing policy. Not doing a pricing policy, not regulating is worse than choosing a pricing policy, which might have some limitations. But uh, there are limitations, but never forget about the benefits. Even so, I will now talk about limitations very, very briefly. So a very commonly pricing policy is so-called external price referencing, which is uh, the fact that uh, the prices of one country are determined uh, on the basis of prices in other countries. So the criterion is you look around and say, okay, uh, this is an orientation. One of the major issues here is, as you will hear below, there are so many discounts and rebates uh, ongoing, it's not transparent. So in fact, what the countries do, they refer to a list price, which is published, and they overpay because they do not know the real price. And they will come to a price which is much too high, which they cannot pay, so they <laughs> themselves conclude a certain uh, a confidential agreement. And there is a major issue with access, because I said at the very beginning, medicines are sometimes launched very late uh, in some countries, because Many countries do this external price referencing and companies will then launch the medicines strategically. So they will start with Germany, which has high prices, high list prices, free pricing, then probably our country, Austria, will all have it rather soon, but uh, Spain or Portugal will get it two or three years later because with this benchmarking, they do not want to disturb or ruin their benchmark price. So these are the disadvantages of external price referencing. I do not talk much about internal price referencing, considering the prices in the same country. This is a typical uh, policy when you have alternatives, generics or biosimilars. A lot of people say we should do value-based pricing. And I have to tell you, I've been working on, on pricing policies for many years, I still have a lot of problems to understand value-based pricing. Because what's the value of a medicine? How do we define it societally? So this is a quite a complex issue and uh, the, the dialogue on it is very complex. There are certain tools to um, determine the price or the, the value or a proxy of the value, for instance, HDA pharmacoeconomics, which is surely helpful, but it is very resource intensive. And it's a question if every country has the resources. For high-priced medicines, we have seen in recent times 
a lot of conclusions of so-called managed entry agreements. They are, have also other names, risk sharing agreements, uh, pay for, for performance, whatever. Here we have the issue of transparency again, because these agreements, the content of them, at least in the price, is usually confidential. So no transparency on it. And to monitor and run these systems, there are high administrative costs linked to it. Tendering is another policy where some people say that this may lead to shortages. My answer is we've seen if it's done cleverly, it does not need, necessarily need to uh, shortages and uh, not no longer used in Europe is so-called cost plus pricing. But there's the question, how do you know the costs uh, to produce a medicine? Where do you get the information from? It's no independent information. And it's often the argument high prices are justified because of high R&D costs. But we do not know the R&D costs. This is out of a publication from the UN. Uh, which just collects some literature on uh, different uh, estimates on R&D costs and with regard to production costs. Um, we know that production costs per se can be very, very low. I just have here some, some research from Andrew Hill and he showed it for several of the medicines. So to conclude, um, it's important to understand that pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement policies are tools that may help to improve access. There is no uh, overall solution, but they help. And I'd like to bring out three points. One thing is I have not yet, due to the sake of time, talked about generics and biosimilars but they help to bring down uh, the prices of other medicines, to bring down cost and expenditure when you have competition working. But it's also important, it's not only about price, there needs to be an uptake of these generic and biosimilars. So there need to be trust on behalf of the patient. There need to be trust on behalf of the doctors that they prescribe it. And And uh, it's important uh, to have joint efforts. What do I mean? I said that pricing and reimbursement is a member state's decision. But in recent time, we have seen as that all these problems to grant access can't be solved by one country alone. Even a large country, it's not possible. There have been some initiatives like Benelux initiative or Valletta that start to collaborate together. And uh, it's also important that the authorities within, that the regulatory authorities for marketing authorization, pricing with authorities collaborate and that they also get into dialogue with civil society. And finally, transparency is important. And my last uh, message that I would like to make is it's not just about pricing and reimbursement. That's one tool, part of many others. But it's also important to think beyond pricing and reimbursement and to think creatively out of the box. So uh, this is a, a very quick and brief overview of pricing and reimbursement and how this may help to improve access to medicines. So thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Sabina. Quite a mouthful, isn't it? A very fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. And I, I especially liked um, um, that without even discussing this beforehand, you also emphasized the, um, the importance of cooperation in order, to, uh, in order to come forward in this field and also the importance of, uh, of being creative and thinking out, 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 of, out of the box if we, want to, if we want to achieve results. Now, I can see that there's already one um, uh, question um, from one of the participants and um, 
That is, what is our opinion on the recent resolution on research and development cost uh, transparency, which was adopted by the WHO um, Assembly? Uh, do you want to uh, take on this one first, Sabina? And then I also have, uh, I also have some observations about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think uh, I was really surprised and pleased to see that uh, eventually the resolution was passed. I would like to say it was really a resolution about transparency. It's not just about R&D cost, but also about pricing. It's also about, for instance, uh, collaborations, which are mentioned. And I'm, I think it's, it's a good sign. We will see uh, how it evolves. There are some operational issues in there and the regular reporting and that the fair pricing form, for instance, should be done regularly. For me, uh, it's a sign of that some change may come. I know I'm, I'm very pragmatic and realistic that it's a long way, but uh, I felt that about well, 2010, 2012, there was kind of a change. Uh, I work a lot with competent authorities, a change uh, how they view things. Before there was maybe uh, also the hope that with this managed entry agreements that at the expense of uh, losing some transparency, you can grant access to medicines, which is the aim of the authorities. But I've seen in many countries a lot of frustrations about this loss of transparency, which also means that the, the authorities, when they negotiate, uh, are not on evil, even playing field because they, they weaken the bargaining power. And I've seen a lot of discussion, but there was then also the issue uh, does this discussion lead to some changes? And I feel with this resolution and, and some other initiatives, um, a change process is getting started. To phrase it in, a, in an optimistic way, I'm, I'm optimistic, but of course uh, I, I know that uh, it won't change immediately. But I think it's this um, on, on a mantle that people feel and that all involved feel that there needs to be changed and this process is, is getting started. So put it like that. Thank you. Um, I, I quite agree. I also have followed the discussion, especially on Twitter, from civil society, and I know that there's a certain degree of dissatisfaction about um, uh, some countries, notably Germany or the UK, uh, doing uh, quite a bit of work to soften um, the, uh, the outcomes of the resolution. I'm still optimistic, um, also because I think that um, that this is a signal that at least the conversation has started and also it shows the directions for civil society where additional um, uh, activism, where additional advocacy is needed. Um, it has, um, if you like, it's a, it's a, it's a paradoxical uh, result, but I think that uh, we, we now, for example, understand uh, that we need to work more with the UK government or we need to work more with the German government in order to facilitate um, a change in their positions towards even bigger tra or, or, or more transparency. So I'm not as uh, dissatisfied as, uh, for example, Ed France uh, would be, or um, if you read uh, publications or articles by Pauline uh, Londix, she's, uh, she's particularly unhappy, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm moderately optimistic. So I share, I share Sabina's view uh, in this, and I hope, Louise, this answers your, your question. Um, do you have any other questions um, to, uh, to, to, the, to, to us, to panelists? And I will count down from three. Uh, there is another question um, here. Um, 
share best practices in how the community organizations and activists can play a more supportive role to uh, local governments uh, and to help with uh, with better pricing uh, procedures. I take this one and then you have time Sabina because I have a very strong opinion about this and mm -hmm. then Sabina you can take uh, you can you can take your or, or have your take on it. Um, I honestly think and uh, after having worked so much recently with uh, with various cancer groups where pricing and affordability has also become a tremendous problem. I think that we will not be successful unless we do this together. Um, and this is this is an argument that you've been hearing from me throughout this project for the last, I don't know, five years. Um, I think that civil society has to join forces and we have to overcome uh, this debate, um, which I have already mentioned, is debate about health uh, care as a zero-sum game. Oftentimes we hear this argument from governments that yes, we will, okay, we support HIV prevention, but then there's no money for lung cancer or vice versa. This is, this is, this is a nonsensical argument that we have to fight to, uh, to, uh, against together. And we can only fight against this together if we really join forces. So if we start talking, if, if patient organizations working in HIV start talking to patient organizations working in cancer, and if cancer organizations talk to leukemia organizations and so on and so forth. So we have to overcome this uh, unreal competition because our interests are the same. And if we can overcome this, um, uh, this uh, competition um, and these uh, conflicts and we can join forces, then I think that we can also effectively influence government policies. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, and it was uh, several things that I wanted to say were already mentioned. What I uh, would appreciate is really have a very well-informed civil society that understands, that also understands the challenges that governments are facing, and um, that does not only uh, criticize governments and saying we want to have access to this medicine, but to say, okay, we understand, we understand that the budgetary situation is an issue, but we also understand that um, there is not yet enough evidence on the usefulness, on the value of this medicine. And we understand that the government and the payer is currently cautious for the time being. And what I would also wish from, from civil society, I fully understand that, uh, that there needs to be advocacy for medicines, but it should also be said uh, very clearly that certain prices are not acceptable because they then ruin uh, a sustainable healthcare system. And it's important not to, to have um, a fight in between, between different diseases. And if I may say so, what I, I know I'm, I'm realistic and I know how, how the, the scene is with patient groups, but to have uh, more independence or more independent patient group is surely something that I would appreciate, but uh, I'm not naive, of course, and I know how the situation is. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, those are these are those are completely valid points. I think that it's important to see that there are a lot of um, community-based, community-led research is emerging now to generate evidence uh, from from the patient group side. This is not happening right now so much in um, in in HIV, but there's a lot of similar work done, for example, in 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 uh, Alzheimer groups, but also in uh, in leukemia, in certain leukemias. Um, and the European Lymphoma Coalition is working on such a project. Um, the Myeloma Patients Europe, which is an umbrella organization for myeloma uh, patients, also uh, runs such a project that tries to understand access, affordability, and pricing issues in their field. So I think that if we start learning more from each other, as you say, and this is, these are independent research projects which are not funded by any external mm -hmm. Uh, stakeholder, but uh, STEM and also f are fundraised for from within the patient communities. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if we can learn more from these various um, research initiatives, that will that will bring us all uh, forward. I'm I'm convinced. Um, I'm I'm quite certain that there could be uh, more uh, questions, but we're actually running out of time at this point. Um, so with this, I really, really, really wholeheartedly would like to thank you, Sabina, for joining us and, and giving such a brilliant overview of, um, of the field uh, from which we've all learned a lot. I certainly have. Um, and I would like to thank all the participants for, uh, for joining um, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I don't know whether there's anything else, Oksana, that you would like to announce at this point. Um, uh, and if not, then uh, I think that the announcement for the, for the next webinar uh, will be published, um, uh, just uh, the announcement for this one was. Um, can I still add, because I actually had one, one qu two questions, but I would still at least ask you both one question. Yes. Um, I seem to still quite often hear from always also from the civil society organizations who are working ac on access, that especially from the countries like Germany, the countries that have quite well established reimbursement system, that why should they work on affordability? And I would very much like to have your comment on this. So it would be recorded, and I can just every time show why we should work on affordability also in the countries where patient doesn't feel that he has to pay from his own pocket or from their own pocket. Um, Sabina, what, what's your take on this? So the question is to explain why it's important to work on affordability both globally, but also in higher income countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's also important to work globally because we are all sitting in the same boat. And we also see now that the challenges that we have are maybe challenges people were not aware 10 years ago that this would hit uh, the, the higher income countries as well. And then uh, we have to be careful about the an evaluation at the national level as well, because we have now just talked about affordable access to medicines. I have not touched on equitable um, access to medicine. So there is equity even in rich countries. So this is something to consider. And for me, affordability is one of the aspects of accessibility. Availability is also of important, but uh, it's just one component that needs to be considered um, because otherwise um, we won't have access to medicines. Um, I think that actually in your presentation, Sabina, there was this, uh, there was a, a very important point, which is um, which is reference pricing. So if, um, if reference pricing is used and the prices are are uh, very high in Germany, and Germany is taken as a reference point, then that increases the prices everywhere else. And my other argument is just a, a, I know this sounds naive, but it's it's about solidarity. And as you rightly said, uh, we're all in this boat together. So um, I think that um, solidarity across pension groups, regardless of diseases areas, is, uh, is, is, is a fundamental requirement. Um, but it's already working in some areas. So, we, so there, there are foundations that we can build upon. Does that answer your question, Oksana? Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Tamas, and thank you, Sabina, for having this for, uh, for being speakers on this webinar. I think that was extremely interesting. I learned very much a lot. Um, and a small announcement. Uh, this year we are still planning another webinar, which is more going to be on exchange between East and West and different initiatives on uh, good practices in field of affordability, which is going to take place in autumn, probably September. We're going to announce this closer to the date. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.